In this video, we cover our first deuterostrong group, and this is a group of animals that have some really bizarre characteristics. So the groups here in purple, we've already covered. We're, we've left the protostome group, and we went through the transitional group called the ketognatha. And now we're entering the deuterostomia, and the first group we're going to look at are the echinodermata, the spiny skinned animals. Some of the synapomorphies for the group include pentaradial symmetry as adults, but they do have bilaterally symmetrical larvae. They have an endoskeleton composed of interconnected plates called ossicles. They have a well-developed muscular system, but they can also save some of their muscular strength by using what is called mutable collagenous tissue. And then they also have a very unique structure that they use for foraging and locomotion called the water vascular system. It's a fairly diverse group with over 7,000 species, some of which you're familiar with. For example, the sea stars, sometimes referred to as starfish, but usually we see them referred to as the sea stars. And clearly you can see the pentaradial symmetry in this situation. Then we have some with uh, five or more arms as well that are more flexible, and these are called the brittle stars. Also in this group are the basket stars. Then we have the echinoidea, which includes the sea urchins and sand dollars. And finally, we also have the group called the sea cucumbers. The triploblastic and eucelomates, this shouldn't surprise you, all the groups we've been covering have been this way for a while. And uh, for the most part, we've been talking about bilaterally symmetrical animals. And yes, the echinoderms as larvae are bilaterally symmetrical, but they show pentaradial symmetry as adults. There is no cephalization in this situation. Adults have an oral, which is usually referred to as the ventral side, and an aboral dorsal side. So the side away from the mouth is on top. The mouth is usually facing down. They have an epithelium that overlays a, a skeleton of interconnected ossicles. Some have what are called pedicellaria, these pincher-like structures that are products of the epithelium. And they help to, pincher-like structures that help to keep the epithelium clean of debris and ectoparasites. And also to capture prey and then move it uh, to the tube feet so it can be moved uh, to the mouth. The epithelium also produces toxins for defense, sometimes associated with the spines that are sticking through the skin, extensions of the ossicles. The rigid endoskeleton is composed of these calcareous ossicles. The ossicles, as I mentioned, have spines that project through the epithelium, and this is how they get their name, the spiny skinned animals. The density of these ossicles varies greatly between the different groups. So if you look at the arm of a sea star, cross section of it shown here, you see that these ossicles are fairly close fitting, but they are separate plates. And you see connective tissue and muscles between these ossicles, and so this allows for some arm movement, but because the ossicles are so tightly packed, it limits kind of how flexible and how much movement you can actually see in these arms. The brittle stars and basket stars have more flexible articulation of their ossicles, and so they have more abilities to move their arms. So here on the bottom left, we have a brittle star, and on the right, we have a basket star. Brittle stars are called that because one of their defense mechanisms is they can jettison one of their arms or, or uh, disarticulate it if a predator grabs it as they uh, try to escape. So if you're ever in a tide pool and you see one of these and you pick it up, you have to pick it up very gingerly so it doesn't lose its arms. Sea urchins and sand dollar ossicles are so tightly fused that they form a, a continuous test or solid shell. So we see a complete loss of the arm structure. Sea cucumbers have gone the opposite route. They basically just have this leathery skin with a few scattered ossicles embedded within that skin. And so they rely more on their dense muscular bands and the internal hydrostatic pressure associated with the coelom to keep their body shape. The water vascular system is really the most impressive thing about echinoderms, I think. It's really key to their movement and their sensory abilities and their foraging abilities. So let's talk about some of the key components first. The connection to the outside environment is this porous structure called the madreporite. It connects to a stone canal that then connects to the ring canal, which, as the name implies, goes around kind of the, the center part of the body. Radiating from the ring canal are the radial canals that run the length of each arm, 
and they give rise to lots of, of laterally spaced lateral canals. And the lateral canals are where we see the connection to the tube feet. A tube foot really is a muscular tube that protrudes from this gap in the endoskeleton called the ambulacra. So the parts of the tube feet are the ampulla, which is the bulb-like end, which is highly muscularized, and the sucker, which is the terminal end. The sucker can form a seal on a hard substrate and then use some adhesive secretions and vacuum pressure to seal itself. That's the general pattern. There are some taxa that lack suckers on some or all their two feet, and they're used for sensory structures and some other functions. So how does it actually work? Well, water enters the system uh, through the madreporite and then moves through the canals via cilia. The tube feet themselves, as I mentioned, are muscular, and they're controlled by this muscular action, but also by hydrostatic pressure of water going through the water vascular system itself. So there's a valve between the tube foot and the lateral canal, and it closes, and this isolates that specific tube foot from the rest of the water vascular system. When the muscles running the length of the tube foot relax, and then there's a muscular contraction of the ampulla, it's like squeezing the bulb of a water dropper or a turkey baster. What this does is it forces water into the length of the tube foot, causing it to extend. At that point, the sucker can make contact with that solid surface, and there could be some adhesive secretions that help to make that contact stick, and then the sucker has muscular contractions to form a seal. At that point, the longitudinal contraction of the tube foot forces the tube foot closer to the hard structure, and that also pushes water back into the ampulla. This creates a vacuum. Now, once it wants to release that seal, the seal can be broken using additional secretions and uh, the sucker muscles can uh, pull that apart. Now, an individual tube foot, you have to realize, is not very strong. It's not going to have a lot of pulling power, but collectively, if you have lots of tube feet together, it can provide a very strong power to allow these organisms to grasp onto a solid surface. So this is going to be important when they're foraging, but also in intertidal areas where they're trying to hold onto rocks and not be washed away. I like to compare it to a very small piece of Velcro. You know, you can rip that apart easily, but a big sheet of Velcro or lots of individual little pieces of Velcro that you're trying to pull apart at once, that's just not going to happen. It takes too much force to do that. So the tube foot is, they work together to provide that power. So as I mentioned, they do have a well-developed muscular system of both circular and longitudinal muscles in the body walls and then as I just mentioned in the tube feet. But if we have a sea star, for example, down here in the bottom right, and it's trying to open up this bivalve shell, what it can do initially is contract muscles to start to try to pull this shell apart, but eventually those muscles would fatigue and then it would be kind of a, a war of attrition between the muscles of the bivalve and the muscles of the sea star. So what they can do instead is once their, their muscles are activated and they're pulling the bivalve apart, they activate what is called mutable collagenous tissue. This is embedded among the ossicles, connecting the different ossicles. And what it does is it can change from a flexible stage when the muscles are actually working to a rigid state. So it basically can lock the arms in place without the need for additional muscle contraction. So they can relax their muscle, and that way they can usually outlast the bivalve and crack open that shell so they can then forage on it. So it, it's allowing the starfish or the sea star to create a consistent prolonged pressure to open those shells. And the same material can also be used to allow individuals to brace themselves among rocks in intertidal regions. Shouldn't be surprising given the lack of cephalization that they have a decentralized nervous system, basically an interconnected nerve net system. But they do actually have surprisingly complex series of sensory receptors. So they have mechanosensory spines and pedicellaria and tube feet. They also have a lot of chemosensory abilities associated with tube feet and some of the other epidermal cells. And they actually even have photosensitive tube feet and ocelli at the distal tips of their arms. Their locomotion is variable and it has a lot to do with the, the skeleton and how densely packed their ossicles are. So sea stars 
are relatively slow crawling and not being able to really move their arms very much, but they instead use their tube feet to kind of allow them to creep along slowly. Brittle snars, however, have more flexible arms and they can kind of use these to push off and crawl and even in some cases swim. Now this is the point I wanted to make sure that you realize we've gone from bilaterally symmetrical animals that are really good at movement, really quick movement, from our initial studies of radially symmetrical animals that were sessile or free-floating but not very good at directional movement. These animals are in, in between that a little bit. They're kind of slow but they do have good directional control. They're not oftentimes weak swimmers. They're pretty good swimmers when they do swim, and certainly when they're crawling, they do it slowly, but they're very good at going in the direction they want to go. Sea urchins, remember, don't have any arms at all, and so what they use is a combination of long tube feet to move themselves, and also the spines themselves can be used as little stilts for moving them. Sea cucumbers are probably the best locomotors of these this group they can crawl or burrow using their tube feet and uh, some undulating body movements as far as how they make a living as far as foraging goes they're pretty diverse many of them are generalized detritivores or suspension feeders uh, but there are also quite a few predators and even quite a few that are herbivorous food can be captured by the pedicellaria in the epidermis or sometimes in mucus associated with the epidermis, and then is moved to the tube feet via cilia, where the tube feet then take it to the mouth. And then again, we've already talked about how the sea stars have their arm musculature working with a mutable collagenous tissue to uh, open bivalve shelves and outlast them in their muscular attempts to prevent getting eaten. Some of the specialized structures associated with foraging um, seen in urchins, which are herbivorous primarily, they have a structure called the Aristotle's lantern. This is a five-tooth jaw mastication organ for, that can be averted from the mouth, stuck out as they graze on things like kelp. Sea cucumbers use mucus-covered oral tentacles while they're deposit feeding, so they're basically picking up pieces of sediment, then moving that to their mouth and getting the food that was left in the sediment and digesting that. So they're very important in nutrient transfer in the benthic environment. Most have a complete digestive tract, so the sea stars um, have a couple of stomachs. One is eversible stomach called the cardiac stomach, so they can actually push it outside of their body. So they just have to crack open a muscle shell, for example, evert their cardiac stomach, stick it into the shell where they can secrete digestive enzymes and then uptake that food resource. That ingested food is then moved to the pyloric stomach then to digestive pyloric cica, which are radiating into each arm for continued digestion and delivery of the nutrients. And then waste leave via the aboral anus. Sea cucumbers and sea urchins have a long stomach and intestine for digestion before the waste leaves the anus, so it's generally a simpler structure compared to the sea stars. Brittle stars, however, have an incomplete digestive tract. So they have a mouth with an esophagus leading to a stomach, and then the waste exit via the mouth. The circulatory system is relatively simple, and which shouldn't surprise you because they, they're not that active, or at least not that quickly active. They have an open circulatory system uh, with partial directional movement of blood. Blood basically is just moved through extensions of their coelom, which is ciliated, and the cilia is actually what is moving much of the fluid. Sometimes they have pumping hearts, but not always. And the ciliated coelom basically runs parallel to uh, all of the elements of the digestive and the water vascular system leading into each arm. They have a diversity of ways of gas exchange, so the tube feet themselves can be used as gas exchange, given the fact that there's so much surface area associated with them. The finger-like papulae, which are sometimes referred to as skin gills that are sticking out the top of the epidermis, can also be used uh, for that. And the brittle stars have these internal sacs or bursa, where they bring water into them uh, through these external openings and use gas exchange that way. Sea cucumbers have a unique structure called the respiratory tree which is actually branches of the anus and they actually bring in water through the anus pump water in and out for gas exchange. We'll see later that this is also used as a defensive structure in some ways. 
Excretion is primarily through diffusion across the respiratory surfaces, but they do have in their coelom these coelomocytes that are mobile and can collect solid forms of nitrogenous waste and transport them to the epithelial tissues uh, for expulsion directly. Most echinoderms are basically uh, osmotic conformers and really don't have any active water balance uh, regulation features. And these are all ectothermic. As far as reproduction, asexual reproduction is fairly common. Binary fission and fragmentation is possible in most as long as there's some part of the disc retained. Uh, isolated arms can regenerate new individuals in a few species even, so you don't even need part of uh, the disc. So quite a bit of uh, potential for asexual reproduction. As far as sexual reproduction goes, most of them are dioecious, so there are individuals that are male and individuals that are female. Gonads are uh, found in the coelom, or produced in the coelom, as you can see here, and they're released via gonoducts or sometimes just by rupturing of the body wall. Most of them just release their eggs, so they're oviparous with external fertilization. And oftentimes you, you see gamete release by individuals in a population are highly synchronized uh, to maximize the efficiency of fertilization. Again, as I mentioned, this is our first group of deuterostomes. They show radial holoblastic cleavage, and the blastopore does become the anus. They do have several larval forms. The one I want you to know are some version of the pluteus larva. So C and D are showing a, a, a couple of different specific types of pluteus larvas. But I want you to recognize that. They're kind of these V-shaped larval forms. But you can definitely see that they are bilaterally symmetrical at this stage. Because echinoderms can sustain significant injuries and, and regenerate body parts, they have the potential to live a long time, and some brittle stars have been estimated to have lifespans of 20 years. I already mentioned the defensive capabilities of brittle stars by uh, letting go of some of their arms and allowing them to escape a predator that may have grabbed them. Just in general, echinoderms can evade relatively slow predators by just crawling away or in some cases burrowing themselves like you might see a sand dollar do or a sea cucumber. But they also have more active defenses. So they can dissuade predators from attacking using their spines. And sometimes these spines are hollow and have toxins associated with them. So the bottom left here is what's called a fire urchin. And it can produce a painful uh, transfer of of toxins to the skin if you get poked by this. I mentioned the respiratory tree uh, serving a respiratory function in sea cucumbers, but it can also uh, be everted and it has these tubules that produce this adhesive material that can cover and immobilize any potential threat. And that's what's shown here on the bottom right. Some sea stars show remarkable social displays. Their social activities are simply shown in slow motion. But uh, if you take a video and you speed up the action, you can see that there's a lot of competition and dominance displays where they use their arm in kind of fencing battles with each other to try to take over food resources or mating opportunities. Urchins have been shown to form dense aggregations using chemical communication as well, associated with uh, resource use and mating. There are lots of symbiotic interactions between echinoderms and other organisms, so brittle stars live mutualistically with sponges and corals. So here you can see in the bottom left some brittle stars living on a coral. What they're doing is they're helping to uh, forage on the host's surface sediments and this helps keep their host clean. In the top right here I have a shrimp that is known to use brittle star as a place to live and uh, camouflage to help keep it protected. In the bottom right we have a crab species that lives on an urchin host as a commensal, or it could be considered a parasitic relationship if it's eating too much of the food that would normally go to the urchin itself. But there are a number of crab sea urchin associations like this. Echinoderms are marine, uh, mostly benthic as adults, but the larvae are pelagic and this is the dispersal phase. Sea cucumbers, as I mentioned, are really important nutrient cyclers. They're deposit feeders helping to digest food and release nutrients in the benthic environment. Sea lilies, brittle stars, and basket stars are very important filter feeders, and sometimes they can be found in really dense aggregations 
and help to filter the water and turn over nutrients. Sea urchins, as shown here, can uh, occur in very dense aggregations and they can literally wipe out kelp forests in the Pacific Northwest. And some sea stars, despite being slow, are important predators in certain communities, particularly on some annelids and mollusks. So how is climate change potentially impacting echinoderms? Well, in one case, it's shown that increased temperatures themselves have increased the growth rates of larvae of this species called the crown of thorns sea star. This is found in the Great Barrier Reef. The population boom of this species has produced some big time problems for the Great Barrier Reef. We already talked about the Great Barrier Reef suffering from ocean acidification and increased ocean temperatures. This is just one additional blow that's causing some major damage to the Great Barrier Reef. In general, however, acidification usually has negative effects on larval growth. So the temperature itself uh, helps that one species, but overall, it's a negative impact of climate change. So for example, the brittle star shown here is presently a very common species in the Atlantic. In fact, it's one of these that is an important filter feeder and it can incur in huge densities of say 7,000 individuals per square meter. So it's a keystone species. If it was removed from this habitat, the community would change drastically. However, studies have indicated that uh, pH levels as they increase would lead to the extinction of this species by 2050. So in review, we've talked about the spiny skinned animals, the Echinodermata, they're triple blastic eucelomates showing pentaradial symmetry as adults along an oral aboral axis. However, they are bilaterally symmetrical as larva, the pluteus larva. They have an epithelium overlaying an endoskeleton of ossicles. The epithelium uh, has spines sticking through it from the ossicles. It also has pedicellaria, these pincher-like structures, and papula, which are used for gas exchange. We talked a lot about their water vascular system, so make sure you know the various canals and the madreporite and the tube feet and know the function of, of each of these and how the system works. We talked about the interaction of the muscles and the mutable collagenous tissue and foraging and, and holding themselves in place without muscle fatigue. We talked about the fact that they have a decentralized nervous system, but they also have multiple sensory structures. And despite having basically radial symmetry, this kind of pentaradial symmetry, they are fairly mobile. They just do so slowly. And their mode of locomotion varies in large part due to how tightly packed the ossicles are. Their suspension detritus feeders or herbivores and predators. And make sure that you know what some of these diets are associated with the different groups and some of the specialized feeding structures. So the Aristotle's lantern of sea urchins or the oratinicals of sea cucumbers in the more complex digestive system including the cardiac and pyloric stomachs and the pyloric cica seen in sea stars. They have a relatively simple circulatory system. It's an open system with just extensions of the coelom and they have a ciliary action in the coelom that moves this fluid throughout the coelom. As far as respiration there's a diversity of structures used in gas exchange including the papula, gills in some cases, internal bursa, and the respiratory tree seen in the sea cucumbers. Excretion is fairly simple, simply using diffusion in many cases, but they do have salomocytes uh, that can capture solid nitrogenous waste in the coelom and move it to the epidermis for expulsion. And they're ectothermic. They do show a surprising degree of asexual capabilities through binary fission and fragmentation. That's one of the benefits of having such a decentralized body without cephalization. They show sexual reproduction that's dioecious, oviparous, with external fertilization typically. This is our first group of deuterostomes showing radial and holoblastic cleavage with the blastophore becoming the mouth. As I mentioned, they have a variety of larval forms, but I want you to know the pluteus larval form, be able to recognize that. Because of their capabilities of asexual repair and asexual reproduction, they do have some long lifespans potentially. And they have a variety of defense mechanisms, including burrowing, uh, slowly crawling away from organisms, ejection of arms, and then some more active defenses like aposomatic coloration associated with toxins and the adhesive tubules associated with the respiratory tree and the sea cucumbers.
Some do form some dense aggregations and some show some sociality. They have a number of symbiotic relationships, so be able to recognize those. And then we talked about some of the potential problems associated with higher temperatures could increase growth of some that are problematic for other coral reef community members. And overall, acidification is going to be a major developmental issue for most echinoderms.